I'm sure it's been a busy week for everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Ministry of Commerce, Trade, Tourism and Transport and the panelists, I'm um, pleased to welcome you all. My name is Jacinta. I'm from the Ministry and I'll take us through the first part of today's webinar. Um, this morning we have with us the Permanent Secretary for Commerce, Trade, Tourism and Transport, um, Zain Ali. We have the Managing Director and the CEO of Fiji Airways, um, Mr. Andre Fillon. We have the CEO of Tourism Fiji, Mr. Brent Hill. Um, we have Fiji with Executive Men for Customer Experience and Corporate Affairs, Ms. Jenna Asfos. Um, we have CEO of Fiji Hotel and Tourism Association, Ms. Natasha Lockington. And we have um, representing us, uh, representing Gavata Collective, uh, Mr. Richard of Kokomana. So we have quite the panel and we're extremely grateful for their time. Um, I'd also like to give a special mention to our key partners, uh, the International Finance Corporation, and um, this morning we have with us uh, tourism specialist uh, Becky Last and tourism consultant Alice Lutu, who will be supporting the forum. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to begin, your know, tourism should be everyone's business. And today we are here talking to you first, the industry, uh, to share and to seek your partnership on what we hope will set the next strategic direction of the Fijian tourism industry. And, that's why we are here uh, this morning's uh, public-private dialogue on the here and now. So having gone through several um, webinars talking all things rat isolation and vaccines, today I'm especially pleased to share that we are now looking um, forward. So just some quick uh, housekeeping rules before I invite the first panelists to speak. Um, we request if you have specific questions, they come through the question and answer chat um, and let us know if you have uh, if you request a specific panelist um, to speak, we'll do that. Um, also, we'll do our best to respond as soon as possible, and we encourage you to contribute in the later part uh, of today and take the floor. Um, we may not have all the answers this morning, um, but we'll endeavor to uh, get back to you as soon as we can, and we'll share with you our email um, as we go along. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to now uh, invite the Permanent Secretary for Commerce, Trade, Tourism and Transport, uh, Mr. Shaheen Ali. Um, the PS will share with us uh, the Fijian government's goals and uh, direction for a new renewed sectoral plan. So PS, um, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Jacinta, and um, thank you and Bula Vinaka to everyone. And thank you all for joining us. Um, as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very good panel of uh, practitioners with us. And um, I'm acutely aware that some of them have other pressing commitments. Um, so we will try to keep our intervention short. But if you look at our panel of practitioners, they represent the marketing arm, the travel arm, the accommodation side, and also experiences. So we've tried to get um, stakeholders from across the industry representing you. So ladies and gentlemen, as you heard, this webinar is the first of the series of important public-private dialogue designed to set the next stage of development of our beloved industry, the Fijian tourism industry. For the last few years, we have been guided by a plan called the Fijian Tourism 2021. That was our national sectorial plan. And it also um, filtered up Words to our national development plan. The cornerstone of the Fijian Tourism 2021 or FT 2021 was to grow the Fijian tourism to an industry that was worth 2.2 billion Fijian dollars by the end of 2021. And we achieved this um, even with COVID. Uh, if we include the air component, by 2019, we became a $3 billion industry. And this was because of the stellar performance of the tourism industry, all segments of the tourism in industry. And because of this, the Fijian economy reached near decade of positive economic growth, and that has not happened in our history. So what, what was the FT 2021 all about? focused on nine thematic areas. So, and this included driving the brand, the demand for the brand, increasing the product value. And this word value is, was very important and central. It was not volume, 
it was the value that was the focus. We were also driving investments, um, strengthening the linkages between sectors, not just agriculture and tourism, but other sectors uh, like uh, tour services, uh, strengthening interlinkages to ensure that there was more local content. And continued, one of the key pillars was, of course, the sustainable development of the industry. Of course, that was coupled or encapsulated by continuing to uh, drive regulatory reforms. So there was efficiency in the industry. These focus areas carried us to unprecedented growth pre-COVID. In fact, if you look at these areas, they are still relevant. Some may argue it's more critical and relevant today than pre-COVID. So what is the state of play as far as the industry is concerned, ladies and gentlemen? If you look at our visitor arrivals, and this is no secret, all of you know, from, 20, from 2009 to 2019, despite all the external shocks, the industry grew every year at a rate of 3.8%. Our tourism earnings, on the other hand, grew by an average of 8.5%, uh, higher rate of growth, which, which is what we want. So the focus again was on value and quality, and that worked. If we look at the creation of uh, room inventory, I mean, that's the question you'd ask. Uh, from 2011 to 2020, investments in tourism, particularly in accommodation, was valued at $650 million with more than 90 projects implemented. And uh, the, the, the flagship or the key ones that you would know uh, with international brands was Marriott in Momi Bay, The Six Senses in Malolo, Kokomo uh, in Kandavu, Ramada Suites in Wyndham, Pullman in Wailolo, et cetera, et cetera. But what also happened uh, was that FNPF became a major shareholder and had the major stake in our industry. So again, local content had increased. You would, you, there would be a lot of questions in regards to the future pipeline. I mean, this we are acutely aware of this and this has been also affected by COVID. But the reformed investment Fiji will have a key role to play in the continued investment in the industry. And this is not just in terms of properties. Ladies and gentlemen, so this is the current state of the industry. The health of the industry is not bad, but uh, as you'd know, we might now need to make a definitive leap forward uh, away from what COVID has done and the remnants of it. We need to move ahead, move forward as one industry. In terms of uh, renewed direction, colleagues, the, we still have external factors affecting us. We have experienced 14 cyclones in the span of six years. And after 2016, where we experienced the Superstorm Winston, and then we were completely stopped by a once in a lifetime event, which was the COVID-19 pandemic. There were other things, um, US-China trade war, um, the Ukraine war, the um, effect on um, freight, fuel, food prices, the current inflationary pressures that the world is going through. These things will, will be the norm going forward. Uh, as you know, COVID-19 specifically changed the um, economic landscape. And um, as I said, never has a single event in our history brought the industry to a total stop. Even during Winston, we persevered. And that was the most intense tropical cyclone in the Southern Hemisphere on record. And as you hear the Minister for Economy speak about it, in a couple of matter of couple of hours, one third of our GDP was wiped off. Um, so Fiji has all these external um, shocks to deal with, and these is not um, expect, uh, uh, ex uh, a, a, a unique event anymore. <laughs> It, it, it will be the norm. So while our borders have opened um, before many others, we are in a much more competitive environment. There is a smaller market with uh, Asian destinations such as China, Japan still not fully open. 
this means destinations are competing for the same market share, the same uh, markets that Fiji values, that Fiji targets. And so what, what are we doing to stand out? So this is something that our industry and our plan needs to contemplate. So in terms of uh, our guiding pr principles, ladies and gentlemen, you would agree with me that we need an industry in the post COVID era that is resilient, um, sustainable and inclusive. This should be our main guiding principle and we should also seize on the new opportunities that the current landscape presents. We need to move cautiously to consider what type of industry we want in the future in the next decade and what type of value it brings and how will more Fijians benefit from what we create as an industry and what are the mechanisms that will enable us to do so. Technology will play a major role, whether we like it or not. We have now technology at our disposal and we could do a lot more with it. And we need to do a lot more with it because other countries will be doing a lot more with it. And they are more advantaged in terms of availability of technology. We need to take advantage of technology, uh, solutions for digital transformation and personalized uh, experience as well. Um, our smiles and hard yards won't do it anymore. We need to sort of augment that uh, with the uh, state of the art service that is driven by technology, even in terms of greening the sector, which I'll talk about a bit later on. We also need, like I said, quality investments. Uh, if we look at investments, we need to be more strategic on the what are the imminent needs that are currently present. We know room inventory is a challenge during a peak season, and it is one of the reasons we have to um, also focus on our mice markets and mice events. So we need to uh, optimize yield against the uh, seasonality and that's been a constant uh, cry but ideally we need continued investment in the, into our uh, industry and we talked about I, I talked about how investment fiji and the ministry will pay, play a key part in this so aside from uh, like i said before aside from hotels and properties we need investments in new experiences uh, and uh, all the products along the tourism value chain. Uh, this includes the supporting infrastructure, whether it's critical in infrastructure or auxiliary infrastructure. When we talk about uh, diversification within the industry, we should uh, not only think about other sectors, but diversifying into the sector as well, offering new types of products, new types of experiences, new values. Also, the longer term goal needs to be the support of every sector and every business going green. There is a Climate Change Act that legally binds Fiji to its commitment of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So we can't ignore this. Industry needs to take this into consideration we need to consider closely how our industry not be a follower, but a leader, a catalyst to achieving our uh, Paris commitments of uh, climate change, net zero carbon emissions by 2050. We also need synergy. I talked about synergy. We know that tourism has the power to support even more jobs, indirect jobs and more MSMEs more small businesses. That is why sectorial linkages will remain critical uh, focus of the plan. Uh, not just, uh, like I said, agriculture and manufacturing, but also sectors like um, our services and um, areas like creative arts. 
with regards to standards, whilst we know uh, people are our greatest assets, we need to continue investing in their capabilities, upskilling, establishing better standards of service. And for these, we need to partner with institutions or create better institutions. We have embarked on a code of conduct for tourism operators. We have also established uh, child safe policies and we have the crown jewel uh, of all standards, care Fiji commitment. Um, we need to retain the care Fiji commitment because commitment is a good uh, term to have in the industry. We can uh, reformulate the care Fiji commitment, repurpose it uh, for our needs of future growth of the industry. Um, yesterday, we heard that happiness remains our gold standard as, as one of our most genuine as assets during the industry day. And uh, Fiji, where happiness finds you, has served us very well since 2013. But we need to refresh. Uh, we can't keep the status quo. The demand and the appetite of visitors are changing on a rapid basis. And we need to stay ahead. And soon, I'm sure Tourism Fiji uh, is working on this. We'll have an evolution, a further development of this brand. But happiness will be the central pillar. I don't need to, Andre will speak after me. Our largest markets remain Australia, New Zealand, and the US. Because, you know, very easy, one hop, great connectivity. Fiji Airways, our national carrier, continues to make us more reachable, reliable connections, good service, top of the uh, international standards, as you'll hear. And uh, we are now connecting with the larger North American market, which is very, very lucrative for us. Vancouver holds great potential. This gives us an opportunity to become an alternative for the US visitors. Rather than going to Mexico, Caribbean, or Hawaii, we should make them come to Fiji. And I'll talk about this. So um, what does the new plan look like, the successor framework? With all those things that I've spoken about in mind, the Fijian government led by the Ministry of Commerce, Trade, Tourism and Transport has now embarked on a successor plan with our partners, the IFC. The FT 2021, the former plan, gave us a good foundation to build on with all your support. The successor will, Currently, the working title is the National Sustainable Tourism Framework, and it is the framework. That will be our blueprint for the years ahead. We will ensure that it lays out clear policy direction and uh, development pathway, investment strategies, and an action plan for the first three years of implementation. <clears throat> we want to set some goals, some ambitious goals. And these are short to medium term goals, and of course, the long term targets as well. And we want to uh, add focus on high value, um, low volume, nature based options, because our visitor numbers alone will not do it, we will not cut it. This was the case for FT 2021, and this will remain because quality will always prevail over quantity as far as Fiji is concerned. So any plan to work, there needs to be a, a consolidated, shared uh, target or a vision, vision. And in F FT 2021, we had that, to take the industry to a $2.2 billion industry. This time around, we are no different. It's no, nothing uh, different coming to this plan also. Our target will remain the quality target, not a volume-based target. <clears throat> so ladies and gentlemen, I want to give you an ambition, an ambitious target that uh, by 2025, we should take tourism the Fijian tourism industry to a $3.5 billion industry. 
together with the, the value that tourism sector derives <clears throat> and also air travel. This is, this is not unachievable. Uh, it, it is an ambitious target. By 2025, we have three years. This will require us to make the journey from where Fiji is now to where we want Fiji to be. So if I can sum it in one or two lines, we want Fiji to move from an exotic destination to a desirable destination, to a desirable one. From an aspirational destination to an inspirational destination. So this is, this is what we want uh, in order to get that $3.5 billion industry, because Fiji is seen in some parts of the world still as an unreachable exotic destination. Meanwhile, the focus on the main markets will remain. We will establish a roadmap to enhance our competitiveness, our competitive positioning in anticipation of our future needs. Now, I cannot emphasize enough how crucial it is for us to have a meaningful and sustainable public-private partnership approach. This is one area where uh, if, if, uh, if we could sort of point out um, where FT 2021 faced challenges was to get the support because the targets are ambitious, the strategies are vast, government alone, um, whilst can driving the focus, cannot achieve this. Uh, we need to set um, business ready, great business cases uh, as components of the plan. So our, our partners like IFC and other uh, um, trading partners that we have join us in achieving the targets of the new successor plan. So if we establish, if we are firm about where we want to go and establish a common aspiration goal and walk towards it, and be seen to be working towards it in, in terms of our efforts, uh, then I think the national plan will succeed. So I urge all of you to contribute, share your thoughts, um, ask questions, give your inputs more importantly, because we are starting with some key variables already sort of uh, factored in, but it's essentially, again, the plan will be what you say the plan should be. Um, it's not a total blank slate, but we want your inputs. We want this to be a, not just a government plan, like I said, but an industry plan and a Team Fiji plan. So again, I, I urge you to contribute and there'll be many opportunities uh, on, uh, on this, many focused groups and uh, many one-to-one -one dialogues. Uh, we'll ensure that uh, this, this is achieved. And um, again, do share your thoughts on goals and strategies. And uh, if you feel um, they are not reflected at the moment. With these words, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly give the floor to our facilitators uh, at IFC. But thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks to our panel members for joining us. Vinaka. Uh, thank you very much, P.S. Uh... Uh, that was a great overview and certainly puts things into perspective. Um, a plan isn't a plan until we have a shared vision and clear goals, and that couldn't be truer. Um, the ministry is very committed to this undertaking, and we do appreciate your support in becoming, as described by PS, uh, a desirable destination. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'll now call on our next speaker, uh, Fiji Airways. Um, Fiji Airways has been an incredible partner in our reopening and a huge part of our success, um, and that's a lot to look forward to. So um, and I invite the Managing Director and the CEO of Fiji Airways, uh, Mr. Andre Julian, to share with us um, some of uh, Fiji Airways' directions going forward. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to be starting with travel trends. And I just want to contextualize that when I talk our numbers, and um, historically, we used to bring about 65% of all arrivals into the country. It's slightly higher now, closer to 70%. So I don't talk 100% of the market, but probably around 70%. Uh, the way we measure our trends is we look at our bookings. Now, bookings are seats sold and cash banked. And if I look at 
the end of August right through to January, roughly six months, our bookings are growing on an average rate of 7% every week. So week on week, they just keep growing. In 2019, we were very happy if we achieved 15,000 bookings a week. We currently run on average 25 to 27,000 bookings a week. So roughly 6,000 a day. So it's been astounding. And where we originally thought this was a bubble and would stop, it just isn't stopping. So, you know, very happy with it. So, so give you some numbers to that overall for our network. We're sitting today to the end of January with 427,000 seats sold. And in 2019, it was 390,000, so it's 9% ahead. If I break it down into the three key markets, Australia, Australia is also growing at around 6 7% every week. Our bookings today are 198,000 bookings versus 160,000 in 2019. That's 24% ahead. And I then moved to the USA, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. Our bookings held today are 99,600. The 2019 level was 102,000, so we're about 2.5% behind. So the year is slightly lagging behind, but week on week, it's growing by 10% the bookings. So it's catching up. We've seen a slight change in the booking pattern. And historically, most, most holiday makers and 97% of those arrivals are holiday makers um, booked four to five months out. The period has shrunk a little. It's now more like three months, but um, the US is longer. So that's more around six months. So if we look at um, January next year, it's quite soft compared to the months before. In other words, September, October, November, December. New Zealand, our bookings today are 90,625 90, bookings versus 82,000 in 19. So it's 9.6, call it 10% ahead. And our intakes every week are growing by 17%. In other words, week on week, the bookings are growing by 17%. So overall, um, for the markets that are open and flying, which is Australia, New Zealand, and the US, we're very happy with those trends. Just to put it into context, Australia is around 50% of all the, the, the people we carry, in other words, travelers and, and holiday makers. Uh, New Zealand's around 16%, and the USA, 18%. The South Pacific Island countries are essentially still closed. They're starting to open up. We predict that by November, December, they'll probably be fully open. And that's also about 14% of our business. So we're very keen for that to get going. And that's a very important market for us. This is Samoa, Tonga, Vanuatu, and Kiribati, Tuvalu, and so on. Hong Kong and Narita will remain closed for us until the first quarter of 2023. The travel restrictions and the booking periods you need, especially for Narita, in other words, Japan, where you have a six to nine months period required for bookings to happen, you have to be in the travel brochures. We don't see that opening, as I say, until probably the end of the first quarter of 23. So that sort of gives you an idea of the trends we're seeing, very positive. Um, the one challenge we have though is, whilst we're generating very good sales, because bookings are sales and the travel, our cost of flying has gone up because of fuel. And so the challenge for all the airlines and ourselves is that we have no choice but to push up airfares. And I'm sure you would have seen yesterday that Qantas announced that all travelers in, in Australia need to ready themselves for the 25% hike in international airfares. Uh, we've gone through four cycles of fare increases and on average around 15 to 18%. And of course, our concern is that if we keep pushing those airfares up, at some point that could dampen the demand. So it's something we, we closely monitor. 
but airlines have little choice because our cost of flying um, is dramatically up. And to put it into context, this year alone, with fuel averaging around $335 a barrel, we're going to end up with an extra cost of fuel of maybe 200 million in the business. And we have to find a way to offset that. And the only way is, is airfares. Then I move on to new destinations. Um, you heard um, PS mention that we're starting in Vancouver on the 25th of November. So very exciting. The bookings to date have been very promising and uh, we're very happy with our decision um, to go to Vancouver. And um, we expect that the real demand from Vancouver will really start in Jan, Feb, March next year. They will be flying in November, December, but the real traffic will be closer, uh, more likely to be Jan, Feb and March. In terms of other new destinations, well, we're busy with a full network analysis. We do this every year. We call it a clean sheet review, where we sit back and say, we've got the aircraft, where are the destinations we can fly to? What potential traffic will flow? In other words, passengers and holiday makers from those destinations. And we use special models that predict what we call the passengers per day each way, the produce. And then we see if we stimulate it, will it improve the number of produce? And um, at this stage, we still don't see any other destination other than um, other markets in the USA. So the USA, we, don't, we believe we're not even scratching the surface. And this is why I'm going to say that. Of every flight every day today, and this was pre-COVID as well, at least 50% of the people on the flight from Los Angeles are connecting via Nandi to either Australia, New Zealand, and it used to be the South Pacific countries. And once they open up, there will be a lot of that to those countries as well. We'd like to see a lot more Americans coming into Fiji on holiday. In other words, we call it point-to-point -point traffic. And we, we've decided that we're going to do a major campaign and a major exercise to try and get what we call the mid-market traffic. This is the holiday makers in the USA that go to Hawaii, not to not to the Caribbeans and to Mexico, which is a cheaper element of traffic. We want the high value traffic. And this is not your, your, your high, if I call it private island resort traffic, but the bulk that goes to Hawaii. It's a roughly 11 million travelers a year to try and see how we can attract an element of that traffic to come to Fiji and, and try and reduce the amount of connects on every flight. Now, you may say, well, why do you carry that connect? Well, the demand's there. And importantly, if we didn't have that traffic, we couldn't fly daily. We couldn't justify a flight every day. So that's a very important element that keeps us flying every day. However, it is our objective to reduce that to a lower level. And the mid-market campaign we're busy with and exercise is we're talking to all the big wholesalers, retailers that sell Hawaii to try and understand what is it that they're not selling Fiji. And we've done a major marketing um, um, survey to try and understand from travelers themselves, why are these people going to Hawaii or not looking at Fiji? And what we found from the research, about 67% of the people we surveyed, they know of Fiji and they know they can get here with Fiji Airways and a nonstop flight, but they see Fiji as a destination on their bucket list. It is aspirational. They'd love to go there, but they, they liken it to Tahiti as too expensive and only that once in a lifetime that you'd go to. And um, we, we working with these wholesalers, retailers, and um, some of the biggest in America that sell this 11 million traffic to Hawaii to get the messaging across that jump on a flight, wake up in paradise, and you know what? We're more affordable than Hawaii. And getting that type of messaging out there. So we're working very closely with Tourism Fiji on this major, as I can call it, a campaign. And the best part of this is a lot of the traffic we're going to get from that mid-market will actually come here during our low season. 
And so we've always said our biggest challenge in the country is in peak months, you struggle not having accommodation available and off peak, there's a lot available. And so we, we believe that this is a very important market. The type of traveler that you're attracting in the mid market are people in the USA who earn an average between 150 and 200,000 US dollars a year. They go on their annual holiday and spend between 10 to 15,000 on their holiday. This is US dollars. So we believe that's an excellent market that we need to attract. Because if we look at our current traffic coming from the US, particularly pre-COVID, and a little, it's improved a little now, is a lot of the traffic, as I mentioned, is connecting 50%, and the rest of it that comes in from the US is going to the private island resorts, which is high end through our business class, and the rest at the back are largely um, going north diving. So a very strong diving segment. What we want is the mid-market segment, which are the people, as I say, that go to Hawaii. These are spenders. And with that um, three and a half billion target, this is a very important market to bring into the country. So that's our new destinations I've covered and sales and marketing. I've mentioned that, you know, we have this mid-market campaign and mid-market exercise going on for the US. For the other markets, New Zealand and Australia, we continue with all our normal marketing. We work closely with Tourism and Fiji on that. And I think that um, we, we're very happy that that is maintaining the and sustaining the level of demand that we've seen. One other thing that has been a major change for us is our A350s, these Airbus 350s that have huge cargo capacity. They can carry 30 tons of cargo every flight. Whereas the 330s that we have can only carry maybe four or five tons, and the 350s can carry 30 tons plus. So we've seen a dramatic change in freight um, moving up and down. Now, this is very important because freight helps us maintain flights and, and, and in a sense, subsidizes some of the, the, the investment we have to make, especially with new destinations. And cargo business for us used to be 60 million a year. This year, it's going to be more than 200 million. So massive increase in uh, the value um, to the business. So I'm happy to stop with that. Um, I think, uh, PS, I've covered all the points you wanted. Travel trends, new destinations, sales and marketing activities. So one other thing that we are working on which will go live in March next year, is to try and change the way that we sell tickets to give passengers a better choice um, of deciding what they want when they travel. So we're going into a program called Unbundling of Fares, where we basically say you can buy a seat. With a seat, you, you get your meal, but you can choose whether you want baggage or not, and you can build up all the other services and on an add-on basis, and you pay for each service um, that you add on. Now, this is the in New Zealand um, sell on that basis, so do Virgin and many other airlines in the world. So this is something we'll be introducing next year. We think this will make it a lot, um, giving people choices and uh, makes travel a lot easier and improves the value proposition for them. So I'll end with that. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, the CEO. Um, 6,000 bookings a day, growing at 7% weekly. That's truly astounding. Um, we take a lot of pride in our national airline connecting us to the world and connecting our islands. And, I, um, and I, from what we've heard, and I think we can have a better appreciation of the challenges that airlines face as well. Um, these are challenges that, of course, directly impact the industry. Um, and we're also excited to learn of the some of the airways campaigns um, going forward, focusing on the mid-American market and getting an element of that traffic to Fiji. This, of course, aids in our plan, as the permanent secretary had mentioned, in getting quality and also addressing seasonality. Um, ladies and gentlemen, joining us next is the CEO of Tourism Fiji, uh, Mr. Brandt Hill. He will also be providing an overview of 
uh, leaders' trends as well as um, marketing initiatives of tourism Fiji going forward. Uh, most of us had an opportunity to catch up um, with the tourism Fiji um, team yesterday at the forum. So we look forward to hearing from your CEO. Thank you. Inaka, Jazz, and uh, Yandra, everybody, it's uh, fantastic to to be here uh, this morning. I'm, I'm coming to you at the moment from uh, beautiful Malolo Island in the Mamanuthas and uh, had fantastic morning this morning, um, you know, talking with some of the operators here. And, you know, one of the things that, that I'm always uh, excited about is when I talk to, you know, some of our resorts out in places like the Mamanuthas, and they tell me that um, they're, they're completely booked out uh, through to the end of the year, which is really exciting. So from that perspective, you know, we, we are, um, in a, in a wonderful place at the moment. Um, since we reopened in December 1, we currently have had 307,000 guests come into Fiji. And I think, you know, it's really significant. Um, we mention this often, particularly in our PR messages to Australia, uh, to New Zealand and to the US, because it gives people assurance. Um, I was talking to a group on, on Sunday night, um, just welcoming, welcoming a, a group of around 100 golfers to Fiji. Uh, on Sunday night. And it is interesting, you know, sometimes we have moved past, you know, in our language, you know, around around COVID. It's very normalized that we've sort of worked with that and dealt with that. But, you know, talking to some of the people there, you know, there is still some people that, uh, you know, it's their first trip and, and you know, they're, they're getting through those, you know, early nerves. So I think, you know, from that perspective, it's really important that we continue to mention the numbers that have come to Fiji because it gives people reassurance around the fact that uh, plenty of other people have come and gone very safely uh, from Fiji and had a great time. Um, so from that perspective, uh, the 307,000 is, is around about 55% of 2019's level. Uh, but what's exciting is that RBF have confirmed that the spend uh, is at 82% of, of 2019. So we are getting um, tourists spending more in, in Fiji, which is, which is wonderful. And if you look at just the last couple of months, uh, in terms of our comparison to 2019, we're up around 82%. Uh, and that continues to grow you know, every month in terms of how we're tracking uh, compared to that 2019 you know, peak month, which is uh, you know, very, very strong. So from that perspective, um, we've had to uh, continually re-forecast our, our numbers and our anticipation of how many people we expect to see arriving into Fiji. Um, we the first uh, original reforecast um, done with Reserve Bank of Fiji was for 440,000. That's subsequently been reforecast again. Uh, so we're now looking at 492,000 uh, through to the end of the year. And look, the way things are going through through August, um, you know, there's every chance that we'll tick over 500,000 before the year is out, which is an incredible result. We next year um, our full year target. Uh, sits at 674,760. So uh, that's our stretch target. Uh, but, you know, if things continue as, as they are, there's every opportunity that potentially that might go even, even higher. Uh, and obviously it's very exciting to hear from, you know, PS to have a number. Um, you know, we've talked about, you would have heard in, in the um, Tourism Fiji corporate plan that we talked about three three billion and then now to go out to 2025 with 3.5 billion is, is, is very exciting um, target to aim at. As Andre mentioned, you know, 92 percent of our guests at the moment are coming from Australia, New Zealand, North America. Uh, it is really significant that we've never had more Australians in Fiji than we do today, which is which is quite incredible. Um, we're very excited about the opportunity in, in Vancouver. Um, we've seen some very smart work by Fiji Airways in terms of you know increasing uh, capacity uh, into into Melbourne with Adelaide coming on, uh, and now with Vancouver being added to to LA and San Francisco. So, uh, as Chair rightly mentioned, you know we're working very hard. Um, our, most of our money goes into the US, and we're working very hard with our industry over there, and and really starting to get some major wins. It's it's very exciting when you talk to Marriott, Sheraton. Um, intercontinental, et cetera, some of these properties, their percentage of US guests has gone up considerably. Uh, and even yesterday, last night, I was at a function, I was talking to, to Gareth and his team at Barefoot Manta uh, and the Barefoot Group, and, and they've seen more Americans in the last six months than they, than they had ever seen before. So 
we're really um, excited about you know that that um, import that we're that we're making into into the US, and we want that to continue. So just looking ahead um, in terms of what we're uh, we're doing from a marketing perspective, um, you know what we're seeing in in Fiji, we're seeing twenty five to sixty four year olds. About sixty percent of our guests are in that bracket. Uh, twenty percent are under fourteen. Uh, Twelve percent in that fourteen to twenty five year bracket, and nine percent sixty five plus. So you know, from that perspective, one of the things that we're very focused on is that we we know we're getting that family group, but we also working very hard, particularly in the digital and social space, getting the right influences here, etc., to try and get that slightly younger crowd and and. Um, one of the exciting trends that we're seeing at the moment is the um, we're overweighting at the moment in females. So that's fantastic when you talk to Cloud Nine, Seventh Heaven, Mala Mala Beach Club, South Seas, etc., um, that they are telling us um, they're seeing a lot of uh, female groups, so girl groups coming over um, to Fiji, which is wonderful, solo travelers, um, etc. So that's an exciting trend, and we want to, that to, to, to keep going. Um, we also are very focused on conferencing. We've added a, a new staff member um, who is working on, on business events, Melissa, um, and we're seeing conferencing, you know, it's slow to come back, but we are working really hard on that space and, and starting to get some real traction in conferencing. With our new campaign, as, uh, as PS pointed out, um, we have been working really hard to sort of dial into what our unique selling proposition is. Um, it's, it's a funny thing to say, but essentially what we think is that, you know, Fiji, the thing that sets Fiji apart is Fijians. Uh, and, and by that, we mean, you know, the, the culture of Fiji, the unique um, multicultural element of Fiji with that, you know, wonderful um, smorgasbord of, of food and culture and dance and song and happiness and, and so on that, that just comes naturally from, from Fiji. And so uh, the campaign, is titled "Where Happiness Comes Naturally." We shared that um, with some of the some of the team yesterday, and we also have a, a brand evolution which is happening at the same time, uh, which will be coming out. So that will be launched um, to industry here in Fiji on October six, and then globally on October ten, with uh, appropriately at Fiji Day. Um, and there, there is a little bit of nostalgia to that. It was one year ago exactly on Fiji Day that. Um, Chair Andre and PS, uh, the, the AG, Prime Minister, et cetera, we were all in Suva um, announcing the opening of, of December 1 on Fiji Day last year. And it's really significant that 12 months on, we're in a really strong position, launching a new brand and new campaign uh, globally to the world, which is great. So that campaign will tap into things like culture, sustainability, those unique elements. And, and as PS said, very much around uh, driving quality uh, in, into into Fiji. So, from that perspective, that campaign we're continuing to share that uh, that as that comes through, um, and we'll share more with the industry. We we are shooting that campaign next week, so we're we're shooting across uh, Pacific Harbour, uh, Coral Coast, and the Marmanutans, and a little bit up into Yasawa. Um, but the intention is that everybody can benefit from that. We will be producing industry toolkits. Um, we very much want a, a really integrated campaign. So the idea is that we go out with our global spend um, with the, where happiness comes naturally and we send that audience through to Fiji Airways to convert on, uh, on Fiji Airways who will have a sale on at the same time. And we're starting to work with some of our accommodation partners who have also indicated that we get access to their large scale databases like the Marriott Group and IHG and, and the Core. Um, who will give us access to their databases and so on. So we can push the where happiness comes naturally message and get more of those mid-market Americans and uh, Australians and, and Kiwis. So from that perspective, you know, we're really excited about that. We've, we've seen some incredible numbers uh, that came through with our, um, our original Where Happiness Finds You campaign that, that starred Rebel Wilson. We had just some unbelievable, you know, PR figures around the world captured the world's attention and um, we've got some great opportunities through the back half of this year to, to um, at some of the most major travel conferences around the world where we've been asked to come and present and speak on Fiji's recovery because it's uh, it's seen as a blueprint around the world for of how to uh, open up a country, which for a small island nation is, is something we're really proud of. So 
I'll leave it there, Jazz, but um, we're certainly very excited about uh, the next month or so uh, in terms of that campaign coming through. We expect that that's going to give us a little bump through to the end of the year. And then, and what we're really excited about is, is 2023 to really get stuck in. Um, I'm really looking forward to this process, the NSTF working with the wonderful team at IFC and, and NC Triple T. I think we've got a real opportunity in front of us if we um, you know, look at our investment and inventory going forward, um, that there's a real opportunity for, for Fiji to continue to be that you know, buzz destination of choice for many, many years to come, which will employ lots of Fijians and, and grow all of our, um, you know, collective uh, income as a, as a country. So very exciting times ahead and it's great to be a part of it. Thank you, Jazz. Anaka. Thank you very much, uh, CEO. Um, so we're seeing some strong numbers from bookings to rivals to yield. You know, see some changes in the trends as, as expected. Um, this of course, has a direct bearing on how individual businesses sell themselves as well. I did sit in the webinar yesterday with her boss and where we spoke about happiness in PG and how it has more depth and power, but it's still an underplayed asset. So we are especially excited about the brand evolution. Um, colleagues, I would like to now invite uh, Ms. Fantasha Lockington, CEO of Fiji Hotel and Tourism Association, to join us and uh, share with us her perspective and trends that she sees uh, from an industry perspective as well. Thank you, CEO. Thank you, Jacinta. Bulabinaka, everybody. Uh, and thank you uh, for the invite and the chance and opportunity to discuss. Um, Mine is on high level uh, on the national budget, what is present and, and what needs uh, addressing now. So I'll go right into it. And I'll start with our current challenges for tourism that include, and there's seven on my list. Uh, top of the list obviously is the increasing costs for fuel, the increasing costs of imported items, the ongoing supply chain issues, the effects of the Ukraine and Russia conflict, uh, increasing infl inflation in our key visitor markets, a limited pool of skilled workforce and climate impacts. And of those seven, um, numbers three to six, the supply chain issues, the effects of the Ukraine-Russia conflict, uh, inflation, growing inflation in our key visitor markets and um, the issues with our skilled workforce, those will, we believe, uh, are either out of our control right now or will be addressed uh, by 2023. But the ones that we can effectively plan for uh, through a wider national sustainability lens specifically, and through ways to encourage sustainable and transformative tourism are the fuel and import costs and the climate change impacts. Within these two very critical areas that impact tourism, fuel costs and climate impacts are the impacts that are not only just outside our control, but are certainly areas that we can mitigate and plan for. It's a small island nation. It's recognized for its advocacy in international forums to tackle climate change, but it's also known for its efforts to implement green initiatives. And these have been implemented across um, sectors like tourism, agriculture, and even transportation. And we can see the government has uh, started to acknowledge the need for sustainable economic, social, and environmental reforms. And we also see that they've started to rethink strategies for longer term prosperity through both green investments and through supportive policies and tools that protect our natural capital and obviously promote our social inclusive development. And Fiji is committed to a really ambitious climate change mitigation goal, 100% renewables for its electricity generation by 2030 and legislating a net zero carbon emission target by 2050. These are huge goals. So. With the global pandemic, that is one of several development challenges that we've seen has compromised our economic growth. But it's also forced us to hit pause and reevaluate how we do our day-to-day -day business, plan for emergencies, and even review our services and products because of the changes we've seen in visitor demand. And much of these have been discussed now um, by Andre, by Brent, and even by the PS. If I can break it down to three main areas of focus um, that we believe uh, should have immediate and ongoing national focus, I'll start with energy. Tourism's highest cost in business is the area that we will need to ramp up exponentially in our efforts to go greener or be far more sustainable and reduce our costs. 
renewable energy to displace uh, to replace diesel uh, and support or back up our current energy needs. We need to be considering geothermal power accessibility that can, if you think about it, eventually access Fiji's many geothermal outlets around the country, especially in the north and the west. Um, we need to be thinking about access to more affordable wind and solar power and to rethink options for portable, durable power sources so that many of our smaller island resorts have better and more affordable options to swap out their diesel generators for. Underneath energy, I've added two more, perhaps not as urgent now, but should be planned for, is access to clean drinking water throughout our islands and some supportive policies to have commercial and residential areas a little bit more prepared to be more self-sufficient to access rainwater. We don't see that there's, there's enough of this going on. And then the other one um, just tagged under, under that is the formal waste collection for both garbage and sewer. Recycling and management of formal waste, because currently most non-urban tourism businesses must manage their own waste, while the communities around them do not. And this has two impacts. One is the cost of, to the business bottom line, as well as the long-term detrimental impacts they have on the environment, which we are trying to promote Fiji as being uh, a little bit more uh, aware of and, and doing a lot more in. The second of these three main areas is climate change impacts. There's no doubt that we'll be experiencing far more harsher weather. Um, and we've already seen this even over the last two years while we, were, we had our borders shut down. But the long term sustainability of the industry requires that overarching and supportive policies include both the preparation of this through strengthened infrastructure development and a little bit more inclusive emergency response planning and not last, you know, last minute type. It also requires climate vulnerability assessment. How do we determine what interventions are required now to reduce our climate exposure in the ongoing future? And the last point. Um, is the increasing cost of food items. Of the three main items I've noted, energy and food costs are probably the key sources and highest cost contributors to leakages from out of Fiji. So we have a huge opportunity in agriculture for far more fresh food produce than is currently available. We have the available fertile land, but issues with accessing this and the challenges with technical expertise in farming on a commercial scale is hindering this progress. Everything from seafood, to meat, dairy products, fruit and vegetables that can be grown here, that would not just be preferred, it would reduce our reliance on imports and reduce this by around 24 million annually for tourism alone, and apparently by the same amount for local consumption. So we would be doing ourselves as a country, uh, our, you know, the biggest favor in terms of uh, uh, ramping up our agricultural produce, uh, not just for tourism, but for um, local consumption as well. Those are my key points, uh, Jacinta and PS, um, and all I've got to, to add, uh, because many of the speakers before me have already identified uh, many of the areas that are pertinent to tourism already and, and very well too. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, um, uh, CEO. Sorry, I'm just having some internet. Um, Fighter represents a large part of the industry, and um, so your insights are always welcome. Um, we note uh, some of the most imminent uh, challenges you have mentioned, um, supply chain disruptions, uh, the cost of fuel and imports, uh, skill shortages, um, and we hope to address them as we go along. Um, and of course, you made a very good point about going green and uh, replacing uh, diesel with renewable energy. Um, being more self-sufficient around waste collection. Um, and these are conversations that we hope to have more discussions on along the way. So not just with the tourism stakeholders, but with key government um, partners as well, um, as well as other private sector players. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Lockington. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to now invite our last panelist um, who's joining us from the ministry uh, this morning, uh, Mr. Mark. Uh, sorry, Mr. Richard uh, Markham, uh, who will share with us a perspective from uh, SMEs. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Richard is representing Dobata Collective, and he's also the owner of uh, Coco Mana. So, Mr. Richard, I now invite you to the floor, please. Uh, thank you very much, Jess, for your introduction. And 
Thank you very much to all of you colleagues, to the PS and others for including us in this, because uh, we are very aware that uh, as uh, the Sustainable Tourism Collective, we are a very, very small sector of what's now a big, many billion dollar industry. Um, but on the other hand, um, we like to think that we're perhaps ones who have perhaps set the pace a little bit in, in setting uh, expectations for the sustainable part of our industry and um, have um, had some useful experiences that we'd like to share with you. I, I should say right away at the offset that I've been asked to talk about perspectives from the point of view of tourism, micro, small and medium enterprises, but um, we are a particular sector of those. We're not an industry body representing SMSEs in general. We are a, a group, a Duavata Collective has 15 members. We are already highly committed to the sustainable end of the tourism market. And uh, that's part of our, our DNA, our operating practices, um, not something that we're coming into. And it's partly to offer, to share that perspective that um, I'd like to share a couple of thoughts with you this morning. Um, firstly, although we're small operators, I think the Duavata Collective includes some of the iconic Fiji activities and experiences that are being so splendidly um, highlighted through, um, through Tourism Fiji's and, and, uh, and uh, through um, Sorry, sorry, um, sorry, Mr. Maka, we'll just ask you if you could speak up slightly. Should I speak we just have here, some... here into the microphone? Would that help? Is, is that better? Yeah, so um, I was saying that, um, so Duvat is 15 members who include a variety of on land and on sea experiences. I think though small, we, we do offer some of the iconic Fijian experiences, which help to distinguish Fiji as a destination and which have been featured very uh, effectively by Tourism Fiji and by Fiji Airways in their marketing campaigns. And we're very grateful, of course, for, for, for that collaboration and that extra visibility that give, it gives us. Um, but I think we'd also like to share with you some of the um, things that have come out of that. Of that. As members of Duavata, we sign on to a set of values, which I think are perhaps useful to think about in terms of sustainability, because we're very much about the quality that the PS mentioned, rather than the numbers. We are small. We want to see a particular kind of experience and a particular kind of tourist. So we promote the leadership and traditional practices of resource owners, communities in managing their banana. We offer experiences that are founded on and interconnected with the environment and its conservation. We strive to integrate cultural heritage and cultural industries into our experiences. We see travel as a learning experience and a respectful exchange of ideas between the Fijian communities and their visitors from overseas. And we expect our guests to give back more than they take. And finally, you know, we strive to continuously enhance the human and natural resources required for the future that are the foundation of sustainability. And this isn't just words or greenwashing or publicity or marketing. It's something we live every day. Um, we've all struggled like the rest of the industry to get through two years of COVID. We have tried to use that time to work with our, the communities that are our partners, to train them for ecotourism skills, We've worked on the environment to try to do things like uh, developing coral nurseries, mangrove planting, reforestation with native tree species, um, and so forth. A, a series of nature-based and culturally-based activities that are at the heart of our of our um, the experiences that we sell, but also that we see as fundamental to this new trajectory for Fiji. Fiji tourism. Um, and it's been, of course, wonderful to see, um, well, the numbers picking up um, in our own experience and in the figures that, uh, that our colleagues have, have presented this morning. Um, it's great to see also in the official strategy, more emphasis on quality, more emphasis on, um, on sustainability. And um, 
It's also been particularly exciting for us to see, for instance, in the IFC and Ministry study of the future of tourism in Banoa Levu, that they that identified the, the great value or the great potential of nature-based and community-based tourism to contribute to the sustainable development of tourism. But um, one of the things we would like to ask you to consider is whether it's possible to improve the fineness of data collecting so that we can tell whether we're making progress towards sustainability. Um, we've heard something about quite a lot about the numbers coming in, the tar higher level targets, but, um, and we want that kind of quality tourist who really values the fact that they are in Fiji, not just some other place that offers them a swimming pool and a noisy jet ski to go around the bay, but that really gives them a quality experience and interaction with Fiji culture and the environment. So um, we'd love to see some data that tells us what proportion of the tourism dollar remains in Fiji and where in our society and economy do these dollars end up. There are three pillars as we see it of all of us as sustainability, cultural, environmental, and economic. But it's a key element of that economic pillar that the development should be inclusive, and that the share of benefits should be equitable. And it may be worth reflecting as we go forward on some indicators for that. I don't want to point fingers or anything like that, but just to slightly dramatize it for you, in Sabu Sabu, where, where, where we are based, uh, we, are, we have been in general, as the tourist industry, happy to see the return of cruise ships including the big ones, okay? And so Savu Savu is a community of 5,000 souls. Um, there's 3,000, 4,000 people on one of those big cruise ships. What's the impact on local services, water, sewerage, waste disposal, but also what's the quality of the benefit that comes in from those tourist dollars? Um, for instance, one of the um, important things around uh, Sabu Sabu is visits to uh, Fijian communities with beautiful waterfalls, a brief encounter at least with Fijian culture. The cruise company pays 10 Fiji dollars per head for each tourist who visits the village. We know through talking to the tourists themselves that they are being charged on board 90 Australian dollars or more for that experience. Now, is that an equitable share going to the communities? I mean, this is not a complaint on behalf of Duavata. We, I think, in our members are fairly strong-willed and we're probably quite assertive in demanding our share. But, you know, if we're going to see a truly inclusive uh, tourist industry, we've got to strengthen the hand of communities in developing community-based ecotourism and culturally-based tourism products. Um, similarly, we've got through the last two years, somehow we've survived. That was felt like it was in deep doubt at the time, but we, we are coming out of it. And we're really grateful and glad to see that some of our members have been um, obtaining grants to raise their game in terms of e-commerce, direct marketing. This is vital for the SMSE sector. Um, and But I think we've got to do more. Um, it's very hard for a community, let's say, developing an eco-tourist experience to get into that market. They need help. A number of the actually great things about the COVID experience, if that's not a silly thing to say, was the way that different stakeholders in the industry pulled together, and we were grateful to be included in that effort. We had a lot of interactions with Fiji Airways, with Tourism Fiji and so on during the survival phase during COVID, and we were grateful for that, and we would really like to, to see that going forward. And perhaps now it can be recast in terms of not just survival, but how do we make the industry more su sustainable? Because we see that as the, as the strength, the experience that we can contribute to the dialogue. Um, Fantasha mentioned some of the things about um, greener energy and so on. I mean, our, our members, though small, are already doing a lot of these things in terms of solar energy, using our own rainwater, disposing of our own waste, recycling it in a responsible way, making compost, growing organic vegetables, and so on. Um, we're keen to share those experiences. There's a lot more that needs to be done. We, um, some of the experience we had during lockdown, we, we, we tried to engage in the North with some of our more conventional tourist partners um, about building back better, bringing back more sustainable tourism. And we were very conscious that 
some of our potential partners saw sustainability as a threat that they thought that they would be accused of being unsustainable or that there'd be new um, new standards and, and imposed on them new costs this kind of thing um, we've obviously got to, a lot to do in terms of of helping the industry to understand what is sustainability you know what are the elements which are the ones that are actually a win-win and not just a, not just greenwashing for marketing purposes but which ones can actually help their business at reasonable cost to appeal more to their to the to, to their customers and i think again all right we're not big players we're not experts in this game but we have had some experience in this area which we'd be keen and happy to share with, with other tourism operators we'd obviously like to see more um, of the mainline tourist industry involved in conservation that's our lifeblood during the um, shutdown we are fortunate to be able to offer do about the conservation leadership experiences to to communities instead of to or to youth groups and so even to the sometimes the elders and decision makers in the communities the sort of things that we talk about often to tourists um we'd really like to see this become mainstream that part of the unique comparative advantage of fiji yes it's culture but also it's its unique environment so again not just pretty posters of orange doves and shining parrots, but that people should help their customers, their guests to get engaged in those things, in mangrove replanting. And, and we've seen, you know, Fiji Airways do get, get into this kind of thing. I think this could become more mainstream. So that people think of this as an environmental destination. Fiji already has quite a high profile, thanks to our leaders in the international discussion about climate change and climate resilience. Um, this is this could be a tourism selling point as well. Get people involved. There's a there's a growing enthusiasm, a sector of that of the, of the market that's actually interested to hands on do those things. I suppose. In order to, to shift our tourism sector to one that's founded on these real, a real commitment to these principles of sustainability, um, we really feel that the tourism framework needs to um, both recognize the enormous potential of the small end of the market to contribute to this, um, but also to try and that in the policy framework and the policy effort. This is not easy. Um, COVID has shown us how much resilience there is in the sector, but it's also helped us to, 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 to sharply bring into relief some of the, some of the obstacles and difficulties. Um, we've somehow got to move into the situation where, um, where the policy framework is enabling and encouraging with not rather than the emphasis as it feels at the moment to SMSEs as enforcement and we're talking about things like um, hotel licensing health and safety fire e-commerce these kind of things um, we're not suggesting that the small operators should be absolved of the of the obligation to have clean kitchens and things like that um, but we're just saying that um, and in fact, we rather the opposite way around. We say we think that it's important that there should be a fit for purpose regulatory framework that gives visitors, tourists the confidence to visit that, to be engaged with the community sector, the ecotourism sector, um, with the appropriate level of regulation. I mean, I think if we're honest about it, the, the regulatory framework that's been set up over the past 20, 30 years has been mainly designed for the conventional tourism market, for resorts and so on like that. And now, if we move towards things like encouraging communities to offer homestays, um, nature-based, community-based experiences, is the regulatory framework fit for purpose? Is it appropriate? We, we feel it isn't on the whole from our own particular experiences. 
Um, I won't share with you, particularly in this forum, the more painful elements, but we could talk about those because it is instructive. Um, and I think it's just as a principle to try to think how, um, for, for, for instance, just to take a simple example, there really is no government recognition for a community homestead at the moment. Some of our, our members are offering treks with, with homestays or nature-based experiences with village homestays. There is, there is, there is no appropriate means to, to regulate and give confidence to that sector of the industry. Um, and we've even been suggesting things like, well, the way for community to operate is to actually put a uh, invest in a hotel outside the village boundary and operate that as a conventional business. Well, that kind of misses the point of the thing, you know. So, how do we work with government? We are enthusiastic, keen to work with government to to talk about how the 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 regulatory and policy framework can be adjusted so that it's encouraging and enabling rather than. Um, emphasizing um, standards and enforcement, which we think is part of why the industry sees uh, sustainability as possibly uh, a threat rather than an opportunity or a very mixed blessing. So for it to really contribute as a sort of unique feature of Fiji's tourist offering and the foundation for the industry going forward in a, you know, in a high value, high quality way, um, we've got to we've got to fix some of these things, work on them, have some good indicators for environmental quality, um, social interactions, and inclusion, that economic inclusion to 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 see whether we really are making progress towards uh, a genuinely more sustainable tourism policy. Thanks. Thank you very, very much. Um, um, uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, the Drawbata Collective are, in fact, leaders in promoting sustainable tourism. And as a collective, they've been they're representing some of the smaller operators who have more unique challenges than most other operators. So we do want to be as inclusive as possible in any goal or any strategy that we develop. Um, we also agree that quality visitors uh, don't necessarily mean uh, is not only measured by the money they bring in, but uh, their respect to both our culture and our environment. Uh, and of course, to ensure that any benefit is equitable to the community as well, and that should be at the heart of our planning. Um, we also take note that there is a need to establish more baseline data on um, how we promote more cultural tourism and sustainable tourism, and how do we actually measure their benefit and who benefits. Um, we also note, and this is a very important part of the framework and our dialogues going forward, um, so looking to create an enabling environment for MSMEs rather than a regulatory one. Um, the Ministry is currently leading reforms uh, through our reforms unit in this area with the IFC um, to make them, as you've said, uh, fit for purpose. Um, and we will definitely have more dialogue um, specifically on addressing some of these uh, regulatory barriers, um, especially geared towards MSMEs. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Mr. Richard. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think that concludes the, the presentation, the speakers um, this morning. And again, once again, thank you very, very much for your time. Um, we will now go into uh, any questions uh, and open the floor. Um, again, as we mentioned earlier, um, we encourage you to come to the question and answer section, but I will now give the floor to um, uh, IFC colleagues, Ms. Last and Ms. Lutu to moderate the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacinta. And just to echo IFC's thanks to all of our panelists who've joined us this morning. Um, you know, we know that these are very busy people and their time is extremely valuable. PS, you know, thank you so much for your opening guidance um, and your continued leadership in this space. We, we greatly appreciate your participation and, and ongoing support for this process. IFC is truly delighted to be supporting uh, the Ministry of Commerce, Trade, Tourism and Transport and the sector more broadly in developing this new survey. IFC's work in Fiji is supported by Australia through the Fiji Partnership and the Fiji Private Sector Development Partnership, by New Zealand through the Fiji Partnership, and also by the World Bank Sustainable Development Goals Partnership Fund. We've had lots of valuable inputs today from our, from our speakers from across the range of the sector. Um, so we want to hear now from you as our audience, our participants, and as our key stakeholders. 
We're going into a Q&A session. Um, we have, I think, about half an hour for Q&A and then a remaining 15 minutes we can open up for people to speak directly. Um, and I think we have a little bit of extra time at the end um, to continue the conversation for those that remain available. Please put your questions directly into the Q&A box. Um, if you have the particular person in mind to respond to your question, please do specify that. We will be directing questions. Um, if you wish to speak, please uh, raise your hand using the raise hand emoji. Um, and we look forward to your responses to this really fruitful discussion this morning. Thank you. So the first question we have is whether we'll be sending out a recording of this webinar. Absolutely. We will um, work with our tourism Fiji colleagues to disseminate the recording once it's available. Perhaps while we wait for our audience to jump in, would uh, any of our panelists like to add anything further or respond to their fellow panelists? Yep, please go ahead, Tourism Fiji. I'm sure many of those joining us this morning have some views on the, uh, the thoughts and ideas that have been shared. So please, we, as PS highlighted, we really want this to be a consultative and, and fully engaged process if uh, you have any views you want to share rather than questions. Um, Becky, if I can just, I mean, I'd have to leave soon, um, but given that uh, whilst we are still collating um, questions, I'd like to um, thank our panelists really um it's been um i think um, you know that the, the views that have been expressed um uh, firstly by pg airways um tourism fiji fiji hotel and tourism association do about a collective i think sum up uh, very well as to what are the opportunities ahead and with the targets that we have um, set what are the focus areas that we need to uh, be able to concentrate on in order to get the get to the target. I think um, you know the uh, partnership approach that we've emphasized right from the get go. If we are able to sort of carry that through, we'll have a good plan. And not only having a good plan is not in an end in itself, but having that implemented, ha having that followed, and then achieving the targets that are st stated are more important. We've heard from Fiji Airways, um, the other side, the export side and the opportunities that lay ahead with regards to A350 and the, and the in vast increase in the availability of tonnage. So some of the problems that uh, Pantasha was talking about in terms of supply chain and the constraints that we are facing with regards to sea freight, air freight now opens those type of opportunities. Um, and, and the focus now, the numbers looking very solid. We are in a honeymoon period, but you know that may end in the future. So we need sort of renewed uh, sort of concentration and focus on, 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 on um, driving demand. And the mid market that Andre mentioned of the North America, this is something that Tourism Fiji can use its limited resources and focus on it. And they are focused on it. The importance of statistics has come through. And I think it's, it's good. I mean, Brent uh, presented the type of, uh, the, the profile of visitors that are coming to Fiji, uh, young people, women. Fiji is already sort of uh, banking on a, a safe uh, health and safety type of a destination. We need to maintain that. Uh, so uh, we need to um, get better, better data uh, and we need to be on top of the trends. Uh, Fiji Airways uh, is very good at that. Uh, I think you know there, there needs to be a central sort of uh, reposit where stakeholders are able to get this sort of data. And the ministry's website is looking at the International Visitor Survey and, uh, and has a portal 
where you can go and get up-to-date data. So we will be with working with IFC to, um, to reposition that and better enhance that so that the data that is available is easily consumed by our stakeholders. Um, the doing business environment was mentioned by Richard. I am glad he mentioned that. We are constantly looking at reforms and we are constantly looking at nuanced regulation rather than one regulation for all. And this is in regards to MSEF, LTA, all the other regulatory bodies with regards to town council, et cetera, uh, OHS requirements, NFA requirements. Uh, there needs to be a bit of nuance to it, a bit of smartness to it, so that, that MSMEs are not throttled before they even start. MSMEs would be the another uh, avenue for potential growth of the industry, the potential increase of the industry. So th those are very good points. The other point that I wanted to mention is, is something that we, the, one of the strategies of the plan will be, the uh, Fijian, the tourist dollar getting down to every Fijian. Um, and I, you know, uh, Richard spoke about that and in terms of stats on that, uh, but in terms of local content, we could be very happy that now the hotel stock, there's a certain degree of local content through FNPF. No? Uh, I, I don't know, the numbers are some 40 something, but before all the properties were owned by um, foreign investors, nothing wrong with that. But now we are trying to get more local content, uh, more uh, fill, uh, flow of the dollar towards the Fijian communities. Cruise tourism was mentioned in this regard. So this is something that the plan will look at. Uh, on the whole, I feel that, you know, with cooperation from bodies like Fiji Airways, um, Tourism Fiji, uh, bodies like uh, Fiji Hotel Tourism Association, Softa, and, and Duavata Collective, I think there's a, there's a, there's a um, good pool of resources uh, to drive and develop this plan uh, for our short to medium term goals and long term goals as well, keeping in mind all the challenges that Fantasha had talked about, the long term focus, things like from pragmatic things like uh, solid waste disposal to extension of our energy grid to things like, you know, um, the inflationary pressures on supply chains and others. So, um, uh, Becky, from our side, you know, I, I really want to thank the uh, panel for the insights uh, this morning. It provides a very rich source of uh, a pool of information that we can take forward uh, when devising this plan. Thank you so much, PS, for those further thoughts, guidances, and, and responses to some of the discussion points raised today. Um, you mentioned the International Visitor Survey and some of the reform work, so certainly IFC is looking forward to continuing to you know, support both the ministry, you know, those additional stakeholders that you mentioned um, and the sector in moving some of these um, barriers that are currently you know, sort of legacy items from some of our older regulations. Um, I see that we have CEO of uh, Fiji Hotel Tourism Association uh, with a hand up. So I'd just invite Fantasha if you'd like to come in next. Thank you. Um, the question is uh, probably for both uh, Tourism Fiji as well as um, uh, Fiji Airways. Uh, we, 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 I saw there was a mention about um, Asia generally needing six to nine months booking. Uh, and that once they've opened Japan, Singapore and Hong Kong are expected to come back online. Um, I wanted to just ask, no one's mentioned China. Um, you know, obviously when they open up, there's gonna be some huge pent up demand there. And there's, that's a market that uh, we were getting used to. I think they were up to about 5% of our visitor uh, market uh, in 2019 before COVID happened, whether we are considering it once that opens up, do we have any plans um, for, you know, looking ahead to that market? Uh, yeah, I can I can comment on that, and I'm sure Andre uh, as as well. I look from our perspective at the moment, we are very focused on um, the Chinese speaking market around the world. We we've generated six and a half thousand um, bookings already 
in that market and have seen groups coming through who are Chinese speaking, which is which is exciting. I'm certainly very bullish about the future with China. I think that you know um, we're, we're developing our China Ready program. We've just updated on on corporate.fiji.travel um, a whole bunch of information for the industry about the Chinese tourists and how to prepare for the Chinese tourists. Uh, we, we're looking ahead to sort of Chinese New Year next year, like that around that February period, uh, as being you know when we think things can open up. But in terms of that mid haul market, we're definitely very bullish about China. But it, but um, perhaps this is where I hand over to Andre to sort of talk a little bit about the uh, uh, the airline capacity side. Now, thank you, Brent, and thank you, Fantasia. We obviously serve the Chinese market through our flights in Hong Kong. And um, you know the demand just isn't enough at this stage to consider putting flights on. So once we see that demand increase, we will restore it. And Hong Kong is a very important market for us. Our, our concern is if we put flights out there now and they fly empty, with the cost of fuel, we burn a lot of cash. Also, and there's an opportunity to put a lot of extra flights into Australia at the stage. So what we're doing is we're saying until we see the demand, we're rather fly more flights in, into Australia and, and obviously New Zealand. So yes, we, we're ready to go back into the market once we see the Chinese demand pick up, which is fed through Hong Kong for us. A small amount of it does come via Singapore, but it's, it's mainly the Hong Kong market. I'd like to ask this question from the hotel side, from Tasha. Are the hotels ready to handle Chinese guests? I was looking for my unmute button. Um, yes, uh, Andre, and and for Brent, thank you for that. That's that's great because um, there is preparation underway, very much through uh, both food and looking at. Um, uh, Chinese translators and uh, people who understand the Chinese um, customs and expectations, especially the way they like to have their specific um, uh, tours organized for them. We're, we're seeing also um, a funny trend uh, come through that was um, uh, talked about recently, and that is um, Chinese Australians. So their their recent migrates uh, migration to Australia and they're coming in as Chinese groups from out of Australia. So um, yes, there has been not only some practice going on, but there is also planning for the Chinese market. Thank you for that. Thank you for those responses. So we have a new question. Um, I'm just reading it off screen, excuse my staring into your faces. Um, in the green initiative space, I wonder if we aren't missing the very basics of supporting the industry to actually be able to reinforce such ideals. For example, recycling options for us to pursue information around, to pursue information around which seems virtually non-existent, and that's coming from Liz Scott. Um, Liz, I'm not sure if you had anyone particularly in mind to respond to that, but um, would any of our panelists? like to come back on um, this idea of you know information around recycling and how else we can support some of the fundamentals around greening and uh, sustainability so if, if i can just uh, um, come in first and then other stakeholders can speak but we we like i said uh, and as was pointed out for, by a number of panelists that uh, we need to look at sustainability not as national or international targets, which you know we, we see in our documents with regards to our nationally determined contribution to Paris Agreement. Uh, but we, we need to work with the local government and local economy to address things like solid waste disposal, recycling. Um, these, this is where pragmatic differences can be made. Uh, so it, it, it needs to filter down, the, the national targets need to filter down. And this is where we feel that government policies can only go so far. So for example, the ban on plastics, et cetera, uh, has been uh, um, put in place. Uh, and uh, also we've been trying to also get uh, plastic recycling uh, program going, for example, those PAT bottles. But we, we need to 
the the missing element has been the industry coming and supporting us on on this but i totally agree that we are as far as sustainability is concerned having national targets is important but having local economy local government local community solutions to this is something where i think the ministry of local government and uh, the municipalities together with the central agencies like uh, uh, ministry of tourism can work with so that you know we we make pregnant because uh, i think someone may uh, mention that uh, you know one of our values apart from our people is also our ecosystem our unique ecosystem and unique environment and if we don't look after that if if our environmental programs on the ground just extends to planting mangroves uh, then that that is not good enough because the weight disposal still goes to the mangroves um so we we need we need pragmatic community based solutions apart from so this needs to translate and this is something that the plan needs to look at thanks Thank you, P.S. Um, we have a hand up from Beatrice Nast, and then I think Richard, our panelists, would also like to respond. Thank you. Hello. Am I am I on? You are. Thank you, Beatrice. Please go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can't see it from my side. I just wanted to say on behalf of Softa, um, thank you very much uh, to the panel and PS. Uh, that was very interesting and lots of news. And uh, since uh, Softa, I, I reckon, is covering with our members 80% of the tour and uh, transport uh, by land, air, and sea, I think it's very important um, uh, to work hand in hand with all of you. And we're definitely looking at the uh, reduction of the uh, emission and uh, to provide a sustainable tourism. So uh, currently we're working on new missions and visions uh, for SOFTA. And the trend is going now, as, as we can see on the bookings and things which I hear, uh, to that people are traveling separately, there's no mass transport, that means all the companies need to change their, their cars and uh, uh, the sizes and uh, more people getting employed, which is the good side of it. Um, the other side is that there will be more emission. <laughs> so uh, working on that and uh, speaking as so far, um, we met with the new CEO from LTA and uh, he also has a goal uh, which uh, goes aligned uh, with our goal and with the ministry. So uh, we're working in the future, there will be, uh, we will be all working hand in hand to get this sorted by 2000. And 20, what did you say, PS, in 2025? Yes. Yeah, right. So we hope to do that. So thank you very much, everyone. Naka. Thank you, Beatrice. And uh, Richard, would you like to come in on this topic? I don't know if it's permissible. This is a slightly different topic. Um, what I was, uh, well, I'll, I'll table it and decide whether you want to discuss it or not. But um, going back to this business of, of making the industry more inclusive and to build from the grassroots of community, local communities, um, I think it's going to require a really serious investment and some innovative partnerships to adequately build the business skills of local communities to enable them to actually participate in this really quite demanding market. Um, we've seen some of this at first hand. We've been working a little bit to work, for instance, with communities around the uh, Natewa Bay, which is one of, considered one of the Fiji's the beautiful and unspoiled environments. Um, so we've been working with a couple of communities to develop ecotourism products, as we describe it, from from ridge to reef, you know, that they can, uh, with their unique um, both marine and forest fauna. Um, but it's um, it's really hard for communities. They, they have a 
traditional methods for or systems for managing natural resources and for allocating land and so forth, but actually dealing with uh, setting up an infrastructure to receive tourists, to handle the money without causing social rifts and so on. Um, this is a, has been a really big channel, challenge. Uh, I had the pleasure of taking the IFC delegation up to one of these communities so that they could talk to the to the elders and community members in person. But I just think that if um, if this is going to be truly inclusive to have not just half a dozen model communities, but actually the potential to involve hundreds or even thousands of local communities to really validate their and value their cultural and natural resources in the tourist industry, they're going to need a tremendous amount of help with this. Um, at the moment, the the power is entirely in the hands of the of the of the travel organizers and the maybe the resorts that take people out for community visits and so on. The communities are very much weak partners in this in this exchange. And um, you know, in terms of um, you know, in terms of inclusion, fairness, and so on, um, we need to tackle this problem or this challenge um, head on. You know, possibly the uh, innovative partnership with the Department of Cooperatives or something like this to really build business skills as well. Thanks. Thank you very much for those extra thoughts there, Richard. Um, we have uh, a very quiet audience today, a um, couple of notable speakers notwithstanding. Um, we're very keen to hear from, uh, from the audience, you know, as to whether there are particular topics that you'd like to do a, a deeper dive on in the future. To that end, we've prepared a very, very short survey. It's uh, just a couple of questions, I promise. Um, and I'll just ask our tourism Fiji hosts to uh, pop the link to that into the chat for us, please. We'd uh, very much like to hear your, your priorities and any other topics that you think are critical to this PGD discussion. Uh, yes, may I hand back to you? I know you have to leave us very shortly. Okay, um, thanks. Uh, are we um, ready to close now, um, Becky? Uh, we are able to keep the, the discussion going um, until 12 o'clock, um, but I think uh, based on the satisfaction levels uh, or lack of questions, um, we will probably conclude fairly shortly. All right, I, I, just, I just want to say thanks once again um, to everyone that has joined us uh, virtually. Um, and I think I will, I will leave uh, Jacinta and IFC to explain the process a little bit. But um, we want to do this plan quite professionally and together with all the stakeholders, uh, giving enough time and avenues and opportunities for input um, by the industry and other key stakeholders. Uh, I know um, uh, through IFC, um, the advertisements, uh, the tender has been advertised. We have received uh, interest from a number of professional firms. Uh, we need to build on uh, from the existing plans that we have, tourism, Fiji's corporate plan, etc., cetera, and uh, encapsulate all this into a national document and uh, ensure that the targets are met, like I said uh, in, in previous. So I'd, I'd really like to thank uh, all the audience that have joined us. We'll provide many more opportunities for consultations. And of course, the next steps, um, I think um, uh, we have great partners in IFC and, and we'd like to do this so that uh, there is that third party validation as well. Uh, and we are able to sort of then um, look at this national plan in a manner and get behind it. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks th thanks from me, but uh, I urge that uh, if there's uh, any further sort of uh, airing of views uh, that that should continue. But uh, from my side, Vinaka uh, Vakalevu to IFC and all our panel members and also our valued audience. So thank you very much. Many thanks, PS, for your time and contributions this morning. Um, we look forward to keeping you well informed as we move through this process, so thank you. In terms of that process, as PS mentioned, IFC has advertised uh, for a consulting firm or an individual consultant. We're keeping our options open 
uh, to manage the process with the IFC to ensure that we really have a robust and holistic approach to this. MCTT remain very much in the driving seat on this, however, um, and I know that my colleague Jacinta um, is available to, to any and all of you to um, contribute further thoughts. In addition to the webinar series, and as I mentioned, we have a survey that gives a few highlights of the other sessions that we're planning, but we want to hear from you before we finalize that agenda. Um, we do anticipate a number of ongoing conversations and would really encourage any and all of you to reach out, whether it's to MCTT, to IFC, or, or to our supporting uh, firm in due course, um, to ensure that your voice is well heard and well registered through this process. On that basis, and seeing we have uh, uh, no, no further questions visible, um, perhaps I could pass back to Jacinta on behalf of uh, MCTT just to make some closing comments. Um, unless anyone else would like to throw their hand in the air um, before we do that. Nope, my big screen says no. Um, so Jacinta, perhaps uh, back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Becky. Um, just want to say again, uh, as the permanent secretary has already mentioned, thank you very, very much to the panelists for joining us this morning, to, for taking out your time and sharing with us your expert insights. Um, again, we value partnership more than anything in this endeavor. So we look forward to working with you over the next few months. Um, for those who logged on but uh, would like to have separate discussions, uh, we encourage you to do so. You could reach out to me directly. Um, we'll leave my email in the chat. Um, in terms of the formats going forward, we intend to have one or two webinars uh, by the end of each uh, month uh, from now until uh, November. So I think the next webinar for now is scheduled for the last week of September. And before that, um, we will have, uh, hopefully with the, if you feel in the evaluation forms, we'd have defined more specific thematic areas to begin sort of drilling down and going out into the regions. And as Richard mentioned, going into communities and uh, of course, getting their perspective as well. So thank you very, very much. And we look forward to talking more over the next few months. And Jacinta, on that note, my apologies, Jackie Charlton had her hand up. Um, Jackie, can I invite you uh, to, to speak as well? My apologies for not seeing that before. Oh no 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 problem. I'd I'd uh, typed the um, I'd typed the question in, so I was sort of waiting for it to be answered. I didn't put my hand up. Um, but yeah, great presentation. Thank you very much. It's it's good to see that we're doing so well. Um, I'm really keen to see more marine parks designated in Fiji waters. Um, I think the the fish stocks um, would Im would improve considerably. Um, in all waters of Fiji, if there were more marine parks where, where this could be developed. I was wondering if there was uh, a plan to do that. There is, yes. I've, I've seen those plans, so I can, I can confirm that there is, Jackie. Um, great news, thanks so much. Yeah, I mean, there's different things, Ministry of Fisheries and as some of the conservation organizations like IUCN have been trying to um, promote um, the wider designation of, of what are called FLEMAS, um, locally managed marine areas. Uh, there was a time a couple, few years back when I think fully 15% of Fiji's coastline was already protected by locally managed marine areas. And the idea was that the, the uh, the Ministry of Fisheries and other stakeholders were moving to increase that. Um, that drive seems to have slowed a little bit at the moment. What we're doing through Duavata is through our sort of commitment to the partner communities and, um, you know, particularly to the sort of traditional means of natural resource management, where we encourage uh, a lot of the communities that we work with or they've suggested for themselves to, to, um, to declare traditional tambu areas, i.e. the traditional way of protecting marine resources. Um, for instance, that community I was describing to you, mentioning in, in the Tewa Bay, um, they were so excited and inspired by the um, Duavata leadership 
projects and the establishment of coral restoration nurseries in their community that they, on their own, on their own initiative, established their own tambu area around the coral nurseries. And I think we think this is a, a powerful way to advance because it puts the initiative back into the traditional managers with the resources that they do this, not because some outsiders have told them to do it, but because they, they see the value themselves and the young people have volunteered to become reef wardens and to become custodians of those marine resources. So we think it can be a, a, a sort of both a, a top down from, from, from government and conservation initiatives, but also sort of a bottom up thing from from communities and who see who start to see the value of this natural resource, not just to uh, both the fisheries and for uh, snorkeling and diving and so on, the tourist industry. So there's many incentives, many reasons to uh, improve the livelihoods based on on marine protected areas. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, would any of our other panelists uh, like to offer any concluding thoughts? We just have a, a few minutes left. Um... Maybe I can I can start. Uh, thank you, Becky. I'd just like to say I think it's a fantastic idea that um, MC T is organizing. This is an ongoing um, uh, ongoing webinar. Uh, and I think uh, over the next few months, uh, as things change and we come towards the end of the year, uh, there'll be a lot more um, discussion and, and input from, from all of us and all of the speakers and, and even any new ones that, um, that you invite to. Thank you, Fantasha. And, and certainly, as you highlight, this is the first of many. And uh, we have uh, a number of additional speakers and uh, representatives that we hope to engage with in future conversations. But again, you know, we very much welcome the audience's ideas, suggestions, volunteers um, to take part in panels in the future. Uh, we've started with some of the uh, the bigger players, the, the key stakeholders um, to sort of really set the scene. Uh, but these subsequent conversations we do hope will sort of go a little bit deeper and, and we certainly want to hear from subject matter experts across all of those areas. So once again, I encourage you to, uh, to take a look at the survey. It is, I promise, very short um, and just make sure that you know, your voice is heard at this early stage so that we can design those subsequent sessions um, to really you know, discuss the topics that matter to you as the industry um, and ensure that this is reflected in the new National Sustainable Tourism Framework. So seeing no further questions or hands up. Uh, yes, I'd like to make a final comment. Oh, please. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for this very important initiative. We saw the huge benefit of industry collaboration for our restart and getting back into the world stage after COVID. And I know that when we, um, when we collaborate like we had and we can do that in the future, our industry will just be stronger and better to the mutual benefit of everyone. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, going once, Brent, anything you wanted to add? You usually have a, a final thought or two. No, I just would echo what uh, what Chair just uh, said then, Becky. It's a, it's a great process and, and, you know, we want to work together. And I think, you know, the key thing is that we, want to set ourselves on a path with some key action points as well. I think it's really important that we outline where the accountabilities are and the actions and then go after those as well once we talk it through. That's the important thing for me. So it's really that implementation piece as well um, because we are, we're at a critical time in terms of our um, roadmap. So, yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Well, just to reiterate the next steps then, um, I'm not sure if I mentioned the survey, but we'd love to hear from you um, through that mechanism as well, just to make sure we're on the right track with the topics. Um, Jacinta is available for one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, I think she is sharing her email in the chat or um, certainly our colleagues at Tourism Fiji can help facilitate putting you in touch if you don't already have that direct line to her. From IFC's perspective, we're also really happy to, you know, have direct conversations, one-on-ones, um, and particularly, you know, just to be gathering, you know, the full range of feedback. 
The next webinars you'll be notified about um, with thanks to our, our friends and colleagues at Ceres and Fiji for their support with the platform, very much appreciated. Um, and yes, if no further comments, then we uh, bid you good morning with enormous thanks to the panelists um, and to you as our audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.